Hello, I'm Roland Griffiths, and I'm very pleased to join you virtually to make some brief comments on what I consider to be a vital focus of future psychedelic research. So most research in the recent psychedelic renaissance has been on therapeutics, and this is understandable. But what I want to underscore is the importance of rigorous non-therapeutic research on what I broadly call spirituality and well-being in the service of human flourishing. <clears throat> so by way of background, I've been doing psychopharmacology research at Johns Hopkins for more than 50 years. About 25 years ago, I started a regular meditation practice that I continue today. Early experiences I had in meditation made me deeply curious about certain altered states of consciousness that felt profoundly meaningful to me. And it was that curiosity that prompted my interest in conducting our first psychedelic study published in 2006, which was a rigorous non-therapeutic study in psychedelic naive participants that showed that a single dose of psilocybin occasioned mystical, transcendent, call it what you will, type experiences similar to those that occur naturally and characterized by three important features, <clears throat> principally this sense of connectedness, sometimes described as unity, all is one, we're all in this together. And that is accompanied by the, the th sense that that experience is precious, precious beyond belief. Some might describe it as sacred. <clears throat> and further, that the sense that the experience is completely true. It's more real and it's more true than everyday waking consciousness. Now, participants in the study attributed substantial personal meaning and spiritual significance to these experiences, as well as enduring positive changes in moods, attitudes, and behavior. And remarkably, these effects occurred in most of the participants studied. Now, that study and others conducted over the past 20 years have shown that such experiences predict both positive therapeutic outcomes as well as these non-therapeutic outcomes and germane to the point I want to make is those include positive trait changes in spirituality, well-being, and pro-social and ethical attitudes and behaviors. So what's going on? <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's why I'm here. We don't know. We don't know what's going on, but it seems to me that it's really interesting and important to find out. I think there's something about such experiences that relate intimately to the very nature of human consciousness, the nature of what it's like to be human. Reflect on the mysterious truth that if you turn your attention inward, with or without psychedelics, you can become aware that you're aware. <clears throat> and when you do so, an indisputable and profound inner knowing arises that we can only access individually. It's at the core of our humanity. We recognize that indeed we are all in this together. And it feels both precious and true, giving rise to this ethical impulse for mutual caretaking. I believe that exploration of this inner knowing through contemplative and other spiritual practices, as well as limited use of psychedelics, can result in a profound and uplifting shift in worldview, a waking up to a sense of freedom, peace, joy, and gratitude that many people simply find unimaginable, and the accompanying urge toward compassion and mutual caretaking strike me as foundational to the most basic ethical principle that is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it's for these reasons that I've come to believe that this line of non-therapeutic research is incredibly important and may ultimately prove to be crucial to the very survival of our species. So, 
In my remaining minutes, I'd like to conclude by sharing some very personal observations that bear on this topic of spirituality and well-being. Ten months ago, I went in for a routine screening colonoscopy, believing myself to be very healthy, awakening from anesthesia with the news that I likely had a stage four cancer diagnosis, which has been largely unresponsive to treatment. Now, ironically, the first psilocybin therapeutic study we conducted was treatment of depression and anxiety in patients who had a life-threatening cancer diagnosis. And in brief, uh, that well-controlled study showed large, rapid, and enduring decreases in depression and anxiety after a single session with psilocybin with mystical experience scores on treatment days predicting, predicting the magnitude of treatment effect. Over the course of that study, I spent many hours with these participants before, during, and after sessions. And I often wondered how I would deal with a similar situation. <laughs> well, well, now I know. <laughs> so where did I find myself after the diagnosis? Well, initially, frankly, in disbelief. Uh, it, it felt like a dream. It, felt like it could not be true, a proverbial bad trip, if you will. But over just a few days, I quite quickly began to explore the range of psychological states that understandably emerge under such conditions. Depression, anxiety, fear, resentment, denial, combat, fighting the cancer, all of which seem both extremely uncomfortable and unwise. So given also my skeptical inclinations and scientific training, adoption of supernatural beliefs such as life after death is not a viable option. So for myself, what I came to recognize very quickly was what I had learned about the nature of mind from long-term meditation practice and from psychedelics became immediately applicable. The key insight is that we don't need to identify with thoughts or emotion as they arise, but instead we can turn with great interest to investigate the present moment, and we can cultivate gratitude for the astonishing mystery in which we find ourselves. In principle, we can do this in, at any moment that we choose to. So just reflect on the fact that we humans are these highly evolved sentient creatures. So we can see, hear, touch, taste. We've developed language and mathematics and the scientific method for discovering something about the nature of reality. But inexplicably, we have this capacity to be aware that we're aware, we're conscious. It's the only thing we know for sure, in fact. And we really don't even know it to be true of others. Yet we're deeply ignorant about what's going on. We don't understand consciousness. We're no, nowhere clear. It truly is a hard problem, maybe unsolvable. And we certainly don't know how this project started or where it's going. For me, the psychological off-ramp from potential emotional misery has been the cultivation of gratitude for the precious gift of life itself, of being conscious, awake to the mystery of this present moment. As unlikely as it may, be, may seem, my wife and I have experienced my diagnosis as a gift, a blessing, really, and I've often reflected what a tragedy it would have been to have been run over by a bus on my way to what I thought what, to be a mundane medical screening appointment that day. Because today, I am more awake, alive, and grateful than I've ever been before in my entire life. Now, that said, I cannot know if I will maintain this sense of gratitude and equanimity in face of what appears to be inevitable disease progression. But what I can do is lean into my strong intention to joyfully celebrate the preciousness of life. My heartfelt invitation to each of you 
is for you to join me in this celebration, to stay awake to this sense of profound and precious interconnectedness. We are all in this together. We really are. It's accompanied by the sense of benevolence, meaning, purpose that feels to be so completely true. It's astonishingly beautiful. So please, join me in the celebration. Thank you.